December 1972, North Vietnam. Major Pham Thuan climbs into his MiG-21, knowing that American B-52 stratofortresses are heading his way. Ground radar guides him into the black. The bombers appear on his radar. Giants, scary, supposedly unbeatable. He gets closer. Eight kilometers, five kilometers, four, three. Missiles away. Boom! The first ever B-52 was shot down in air-to-air -air warfare, leveled from the skies by a cheaper Soviet fighter than the radar system on the American bomber. That is the MiG-21, made in the 1950s, still active in 2025. The most produced supersonic fighter in history, with over 11,000 made and flown by 60 countries on four continents. Tonight, we go inside one of the largest mysteries of aviation. How did this run-of-the-mill Soviet plane become the longest-serving fighter in history? We're going to explore how it survived the Cold War, outmaneuvered multi-billion dollar American aircraft, and irrationally refuses to quit even in the age of stealth tech. We'd like to walk you through the incredible philosophy of design that made the MiG-21 immortal, the combat stories that made it legendary, and the astonishing reasons why it's still flying sorties today. 70 years after its first flight. Like this video and hold on to your seats because you're in for the incredible tale of the fighter that achieved real world aviation immortality. Introduction. The 1950s were the greatest revolution in the history of aviation. The sound barrier was shattered, but radar and missiles were behind the blazing speed of new jet engines. The Soviets were faced with a ghastly dilemma. American B-52 bombers and U-2 spy planes flew higher and faster than anything Soviet guns could intercept. The Americans kept probing Soviet skies, and Moscow had no choice. The solution? Design the ideal interceptor. Fast, lethal, and cheap enough to mass produce. Enter the Mikoyan Garhevich Design Bureau with a radical mantra. Discard all the unnecessary and design an airborne missile that would climb to 50,000 feet within minutes and cruise to Mach 2 effortlessly. The result wasn't another warplane fighter. It was a revolution that changed military flight forever. The MiG-21 would become the world's best-selling supersonic fighter, flown by more nations than any other item of military equipment ever made. But this legend, too, rarely happened. The MiG-21 lost the early confrontations and survived only because of sheer Soviet obstinacy. The birth of a legend. 1955, the Grand Soviet competition was a Bruin. MiG versus Sukhoi, both design bureau had been tasked with designing the next generation interceptor. MiG produced two prototypes the YE-2 with traditional swept wings, and the experimental YE-4, whose delta wing shape appeared to be from science fiction. The delta wing was a breakthrough. It had increased maneuverability, more lift, more fuel, and optimal performance when flying supersonic. But it was hazardous. No one had flown this arrangement into combat before. When tested for flight, the choice was obvious. The YE-4 was superior in every way. But oh, the irony. Sukhoi won the first contract. Their Su-9 went into production as the new Soviet interceptor, and the MiG-21 was relegated to the sidelines. Most companies would have given up. Not MiG. They completely reworked their strategy. Instead of creating yet another Mach 2 interceptor, they created something deadlier a dogfighter that could equal whatever the Americans would come up with. The Tumansky R-25 engine gave it the thrust to go up to Mach 2, and the Delta Wing gave it unmatched maneuverability. And the simple design enabled them to mass-produce it by the thousands. The MiG-21F was unveiled in 1959. It featured only two 30mm cannons, nearly prehistoric next to American fighters but that very simplicity would ultimately be its greatest strength. The Accidental Advantage 
And it is at this point that events take a bonkers turn. The first MiG-21s did not even carry air-to-air -air missiles because Soviet missile development trailed the Americans. The Soviets were aware that they were behind. Then the Americans gave it to them by mistake. 1958. Chinese-Taiwanese War. Taiwanese F-86 Sabre fires an AIM-9 Sidewinder at a Chinese MiG-17. The missile strikes but does not explode. It gets lodged in the fuselage like a huge dart. The pilot survives, and the Chinese then transfer this gold mine of technology to the Soviets. Soviet engineers reverse engineered the complete missile within record time and created the K 13 Atoll. As one of the Soviet designers later recalled, the Sidewinder missile was to us a university teaching a course in missile construction technology. Similarly, the balance had been struck. The MiG-21 now had teeth, teeth with a razor's edge. The final test was yet to be performed. Vietnam would reveal whether this unassuming Soviet fighter had it in her to engage the world's best military. David Slays Goliath Vietnam War, the last proving ground where East and West fought in the most bloody game of aerial chess ever played. In the red corner, the F-4 Phantom II, multi-rolled beast with radar, twin engines, infrared, radar-guided missiles, and faster top speed, U.S. technological dominance in its prime. In the blue corner, the MiG-21, single-engine, primitive radar, primitive heat-seeking missiles, David vs. Goliath. On paper, it was uneven combat. The F-4 doubled MiG-21's radar range. It had long-range AIM-7 Sparrow missiles that could kill at ranges beyond what MiG could even detect. But Soviet-trained Vietnamese pilots were playing by different rules. Not in head-on intercepts, where they would get shot down. But they used a tactic. They'd come in from the side or the back, using the MiG-21's small size and high speed to surprise the enemy. If they could close to gun distance to dogfight, the Americans were in deep trouble. And here's the irony. Initial F-4 Phantoms didn't even have cannons on board. American military thinking was so obsessed with missiles that they neglected close-range combat. When a MiG-21 was within gun range, the billion-dollar F-4 was an easy target. The consequence was disaster. Vietnamese aces, such as Nguyen Van Kok, who won nine victories in MiG-21s, showed that technology could be overcome by tactics and flying ability. The Americans were so impressed, they opened the Navy Fighter Weapons School, Top Gun, to study how to dogfight again. World Domination Vietnam was only the start. The MiG-21 would go on to rule the world. By the 1960s, this Soviet air fighter was viral even more viral in a few years than an internet video would be in decades to come. There were more than 60 countries that had MiG-21s in the skies, from Finland's icy runways to Egypt's scorching deserts. Why did they all want one? Simple economics. For the price of one F-4 Phantom, you could afford three MiG-21s. And those three MiG-21s could be repaired by ordinary mechanics with simple tools, taken off short dirt strips, and kept operational even when spares became scarce. The MiG-21 brought supersonic flight into the people's hands. Countries that never possessed jet fighters now had credible air forces. Finland was the first export customer not because they had been on good terms with the Soviet Union, but because Premier Khrushchev wanted to export to them MiG-21s as defense against German aggression. Finland could not avoid what he described as a top-notch aircraft. India manufactured them under license, and Egypt used them in desert warfare. Cuba is 90 miles from Florida, and even China manufactured over 2,400 of them under license as the J-7 and F-7. The numbers are staggering. 11,496 MiG-21s were manufactured by the Soviet Union alone. 
Add Chinese manufacturing, and you're considering nearly 14,000 planes, more than any previous supersonic fighter. Evolution and adaptation. But this was what immortalized the MiG-21. It would never stay stagnant in time. The first 1959 MiG-21F was a raiderless day interceptor. Generation 2 came in 1961 with all-weather and nose cone radar. Generation 3, in 1968, was now a fighter bomber for ground attack. Each generation that followed added capability without giving up that initial simplicity. Want to spy? Install cameras. Hi, MiG-21R. Want to train? Create a two-seat MiG-21U. Night fighting? Install better radar systems. The last model was the MiG-21 BIS, which entered service in the 1970s with more efficient engines, better avionics, and up to six missiles. This was not the initial plane that took to the skies in the 1950s. This was a modernized fighter aircraft. Even after Soviet production ceased in 1985, the conversion continued. Romania manufactured the Lancer model with Western avionics, best suited for ground strike. India manufactured the Bison with enhanced radar and beyond visual range missiles to target post-1985 fighters. This adaptability was genius because the original design had no extremely complex systems jamming it up. There was always room for growth, room to add new technology, room to evolve with the times. The Unkillable Fighter. 2025, nearly 70 years since its initial flight, logic prescribes that the MiG-21 should be in museums. But instead, it's still flying around, still in the air, still not disappearing. To this day, 345 MiG-21s are still serving with militaries worldwide. India alone operates 132, which is more than some countries have in their entire air force. Serbia, Vietnam, and nations throughout Africa and Asia continue to fly versions of this 1950s era design. But here's the utterly ridiculous thing. The United States Air Force secretly flew MiG-21s for decades. The 4477th Test and Evaluation Squadron faced MiG-17s, MiG-21s, and MiG-23s at Tanapa Test Range in Nevada, flying them to train American pilots and test Soviet capabilities. They even bought brand new J-7s from China. So secret was the program that American MiG-21s carried the covert designation YF-110. Why is this 70-year-old design so pertinent? It all dates back to that first Soviet philosophy. Make it rugged, make it simple, make it smart. The MiG-21's performance stands the test of time. Takeoff speed, 250 knots. Top speed, Mach 2.05 at altitude. Ceiling, 60,000 feet. And F-16's climb rate is similar. Yes, newer stealth fighters are better, but few air forces are fighting F-35s. They're flying borders, training pilots, and engaging regional adversaries. For those missions, a better MiG-21 offers superior capability at a fraction of the cost. Conclusion. The MiG-21 was not just a fighter plane. It was an ideology in aluminum and determination. Whereas Western designers set out after complexity and cost overruns, the Soviets perfected the art of deadly simplicity. Whereas everybody else built jets for air shows and prestige, they built one for war. Whereas others prioritized bleeding edge tech, they built something that would endure longer than time itself. The outcome? A fighter that has been operated by more nations, flown more combat stories, and outlasted more rivals than any other supersonic fighter in history. From the jungles of Vietnam to the deserts of the Middle East, from the mountains of Kashmir to the plains of Eastern Europe, the MiG-21 has inscribed its name across the sky in contrails and cannon smoke, and flat out refused to let anyone wipe it away. 
They've called it a lot of things. The most manufactured supersonic fighter of all time, the AK-47 of the air, the people's fighter. But perhaps the best description is this. MiG-21 is evidence that sometimes immortality is not created by being fancy. It's created by nailing the basics right. Today, with fifth-generation fighters costing hundreds of millions on the covers of magazines, there's something almost beautiful about a 1950s design still flying sorties in 2025. The MiG-21 demonstrated the ultimate engineering truth. The best solution is not always the most costly one. Occasionally, it's simply the one that works, continues working, and won't stop. If this amazing tale of aviation longevity blew your mind, smash that like button and share this with all the aviation lovers you know. The legend of the MiG-21 deserves to be shared and shared for generations to come. What's another iconic airplane we should visit next? Leave your recommendations in the comments below. Until next time, keep your eyes on the horizon, because somewhere up above, a 70-year-old Soviet fighter is still doing what it was designed to do.